This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It is Thursday, folks. Ted Rolson here, our downtown Honolulu studios of Think Tech, Think Tech Hawaii, overlooking uh, a uh, kind of a construction in the background here, I guess. Uh, we're rebuild, rebuilding the studio. You see some of the structural members back there behind us. Anyway, our show, Where the Drone Leads, where we bring you um, current and uh, uh, relevant information about the emerging world of droneism, people who play in it, the agencies who manage it and such. And today we have on as our guest, from uh, far across the sea in San Diego, Punahou boy, David Place. Uh, Dave, uh, welcome aboard again. Thanks, Ted, good to see you again. Hey, there, hey, it's looking good to see you there. The sun hasn't set yet in San Diego, apparently, uh, like it used to set when we had this show late in the day. Yeah, no. Okay, you're checking to see if the sun's there. I like that, Dave, that's, uh, that's good policy. Anyway, uh, David Place, uh, ex-Punahou, ex-Navy, ex-Naval, uh, 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 postgraduate school and a uh, long time UAS uh, operator, planner, aficionado, program manager. Uh, welcome on board again. We see you in the, looks like the studio loft of your house in San Diego. That's where I am. Okay, good enough. I thought about going out in the backyard, but it looks too much like Hawaii, so I don't want to do that. Okay. Anyway, uh, we're at the at the kind of an interesting kickoff point here, David. We had a good conversation with Jay Fidel last week on this show, uh, anticipating, looking forward to this uh, incredible FAA, Department of Transportation, White House initiative that got launched a week ago today. And uh, then we had more information on Friday and more information even, even as late as uh, today on this Department of Transportation FAA pilot program where UAS, unmanned air system, drone operations, uh, as conceived by state, local, and tribal governments and agencies to best affect the usage of these systems in their own domains is what this pilot program is all about. And that is really an incredible turn of events. And in my mind, we could either see massive success, we could see massive failure too, because I don't think we in the local state area are really uh, used to taking over and, and providing insight to federal activities that have long stood the test of time in terms of, uh, in this case, airspace ownership. So let's kind of discuss back and forth where this all might go, look for a model where it might, it might be useful to wrap our relevant thinking around, but, but discuss how we should all go forward uh, from the knowledge we've got in the background on uh, and making something out of this uh, this, this uh, pilot program opportunity. What are your thoughts, Dave, on where this is all going? Well, first of all, I did see your uh, show last week with Jay, and he asked some awfully insightful questions for a man off the street, I must admit. But anyway, uh, to answer your question, I think that what we will likely see is the usual suspects that do have a significant amount of experience in this uh, arena participating. They will probably be the lead agents. Um, it's encouraging that there's a presidential memorandum and that he's involving the Secretary of Transportation. Uh, so you have folks like New Mexico, North Dakota, Nevada, Virginia, Texas, Alaska, all those usual suspects where the test sites are, clearly they have the knowledge and the subject matter expertise to make some uh, potent and relevant contributions. My concern is uh, now out in Hawaii, you don't have a test site per se, although you have your Pan Pacific initiative. You are out there with a lot of other folks at the research lab there with University of Hawaii that do have some knowledge and can make valuable contributions provided you're the op you have the opportunity to do that. But there's other areas like some of the the smaller, less populated states that don't have the same expertise that you do, not picking on Idaho or Iowa or, but some of those other states that have just been out on the periphery, my concern is that those folks don't have the resident expertise nor the wherewithal, bandwidth, if you will, to make similar contributions. But I would think if we can get all the test site states, Hawaii, um, Oregon, those folks, in addition to the test site states that do have a lot of experience, 
I think you can make some valuable contribution. And while, yes, the federal government, uh, and particularly FAA, is charged with providing safety in the national airspace, I don't think they have a monopoly on some good ideas. So folks like you, and I know, I think maybe you're going to speak with the Civil Air Patrol folks out there here next month, but clearly you have a, a lot of insight as to what constitutes safe and effective operation. I think that's... And I think it's also valuable that we that the initiative is reaching out to the commercial side and not just DOD, Homeland Security, et cetera. In fact, that's really interesting. And, and going back to your your, uh, your your observation about Jay Fidel and his man in the street status and the, the the great questions he asked, we do have a teleprompter here in the studio, and there might have been something up on it which would have helped Jay a lot if he can follow the track. That's often a problem. So we may have actually had him read the teleprompter from the last show. You never know. Anyway, uh, it's great to have these opportunities to interact with Jay, interact with you, and get your ideas. And, and your ideas, of course, are those formed from your network of, of folks. And my ideas are from my network. We jam them together here on the show. We could make this the official show of the FAA, Department of Transportation, UAS pilot program. And, and we could be glad to give this show to the FAA, let them have it. This is state and local speaking right to the heart of the, of the Fed. So that's cool. But well, I think that's, that's a great point, Ted, because, you know, one thing I've seen is that while we have some good ideas collectively, we don't have um, a good mechanism, this show, ex present company excluded, where we can reach out to the public that will actually be able to see some of this. I mean, nothing against the press, but some of the stuff they put you see on the news kind of has the press you know, excitement. If it's not exciting, then the press really doesn't want to address it. So shows like yours, I think, provide excellent opportunities, and the FAA would be wise to consider this as an option. Okay, just, just as a, one of the rules we have on the show, we are only allowed to skewer three different organizations per half hour show. So you've already skewered the press. I think you might have skewered the FAA a little earlier. So you're down to one last organization you can skewer, Dave. And oh, yeah. I just wanted to let you oh, know I that. I wasn't in intending to skewer the FAA. <laughs> okay. None of us are. Right. We love them. Anyway, uh, what, what is intriguing, again, is that what we heard on this, uh, just today on the uh, conference call that the Department of Transportation participated in, that's the DOT who owns the FAA, uh, at, be at the behest of the National Governors Association, where this all started, was the absolute enthusiasm registered by the member of the DOT and FAA who was on the show uh, on, that, on that conference call, uh, promoting actively uh, the, and, and, and asking for rapid response and whole response to this challenge. And it's, what's incredible is that the federal government is, and I have to repeat it many times because it doesn't sit in my brain yet, but the federal government is turning to the state, local, and tribal organizations and say, you best know how to use UAS in your airspace. Please stand up and tell us how best to use it in terms of location, in terms of manner of usage, and maybe time constraints or time limits on usage. If you can just stick with those, we'd be very happy to hear what your thoughts are and how to manage, how to enforce, and how to regulate and control. And uh, uh, they're not asking for any rules to be written. They're asking for ideas and then this thing has a three-year life on it, and after three years, whatever is out there either sticks permanently through some formal program or goes away because it didn't work. But here we have the, uh, the federal government turning to the states and local areas and saying 200 feet at least airspace and maybe 400 feet, uh, consider it yours to describe how best to use that to suit the local econo the economy, the local uh, lifestyle, the uh, local topography, the local whatever it might be, because you may know that better than we know that. And, and, and uh, that isn't what we normally see in a strong federal-centric government that wants to build on itself. This is getting rid of it and pushing it out into the, into the far corners, provided we can still maintain air safety in the and, and the commercial and, um, and military air traffic. So again, it's, I think it's caught us all by, uh, it's sort of an enjoyable, enjoyable surprise. And uh, I was just telling one of my colleagues this morning, something that you might even remember, uh, eighth grade at down the school down the street here called Ponaho. And we had to write a theme every, in eighth grade English, we had to write a theme every, uh, every week, every Friday we had to turn in a theme with a subject that was given to us on Monday. And we all, you know how Punahou it is, you all whine and cry when you don't like what you're being told. 
So we, as students, to say, ah, that's a lousy idea. We don't want to write on that subject. Uh, teacher, you gave us a bad idea. We can't write on that. Come on, give us something we can write on. Let us choose what we want to write. No, 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 write on this subject. Okay, we whine, cry, and then submit on Friday. At the end of the semester, the teacher, Ms. Bill Knowlton, said, okay, guess what? For this week, you guys can write on anything you want. And we all said, oh, we can't do that. We need structure. We need to be told what to write on. So, so you, <laughs> you can't win either way. Anyway, uh, that's what's going on here. We whine and we complain to the FAA that this doesn't work, that doesn't work, and why are you guys doing this to us? You don't know what the local operation's all about. But they said, hey, you guys figure it out then. And you have uh, 270 days to do it. Uh, 270 days from yesterday, so there's 269 days to do it. The clock started clicking yesterday when the Federal Register announcement came out. So they want whatever comes out of this that, that gets designed and gets conceived and gets authorized to be rolling in, in, in nine months, 270 days. So. so from your take, did they seem confident that that message was getting, that this message that you're just articulating is getting out? Uh, you know, that question didn't come up, but I think that's one of the points we have to make back. And uh, in fact, what we'll do, David, we'll ask FAA if they want to come on this show next week and tell their story this way. And then you can circulate on the news service that you've got and we'll get the word out to everybody and uh, there you go. really do our, our service properly here. But again, it, it, uh, it, it's just such a, it just sets you back so much when you suddenly realize you can't complain anymore, now you have to perform. We're moving from a complaining organization to a performing organization, which means we have to have concepts and fairness and balance. In fact, I was uh, really struck by the fact that the, some of the terms in here are all about community involvement, making sure that there's nobody in the community who says, no, that's not a good idea. Or if they do say, no, that's not a good idea, then we provide a time or something like that where, where they're okay with that. So uh, describing the location, the manner, and the timing, or the time intervals in which UAS can be used uh, to the community satisfaction, that is just such an incredibly new and novel idea that uh, again, we're you know I think as a as a group we're not really prepared to have those thoughts in mind. We are so oriented towards a structure pushed in, imposed upon us and our response to that. But this also says, and here I am. We have another rule on our show. In addition to only skewering three people or three organizations, we don't allow monologues except from the guy who's the host. So I'll monologue guys one more step here. We do have to respect I think other programs that are going on like unmanned traffic management program. And that's where I was really interested in your thoughts on how the unmanned traffic management program is moving forward and where there are pieces in there that can be pulled forward, maybe in, in conjunction with other pieces or isolated by themselves, such as uh, some of the detect and avoid technology and such, that might fit into this picture of what a, uh, a locally mandated system might look like. Uh, I know there's a meeting on the 30th down in your area, San Diego, where the next phase of unmanned traffic management is going to be looked at. But where do we turn to, do you think, to get a really good idea of what's worked, what hasn't worked, what's been developed, what is still waiting to be developed within the UTM framework so that a robust picture can be brought up and we can pick from it the things that are useful? Uh, that's a great question, Ted. Well, but first of all, going back to your point, I think it's just not only is it amazing that the uh, DOT and the FAA are reach, pushing down to the state and local levels, but the fact that there's an executive branch edict out there that directs us, I think, is a tremendous step in the right direction. As far as UTM, or unmanned aircraft systems traffic management goes, I have not seen an update on that in probably nine months, at least. So I'm not quite sure where they are. Um, so I think this uh, review that they're going to conduct on the 30th of this month here in San Diego will be insightful. I know there's a lot of companies out there that are working on uh, various approaches to, I think one of the biggest issues with the whole UTM is being able to uh, conduct sense and avoid or detect and avoid. So you have to be able to see not just other UAS, but also small Piper Cubs. Uh, the bigger aircraft, like the commercial liners, 
They're fairly well equipped, and we know where they are. But where's the little Piper Cub that's flying along at 300 feet going from Timbuktu to Chattanooga? You don't know. And the FAA is not sure where they are. Uh, you know, so they're flying under visual flight rules. But we need to be, the UAS need to be able to do that. And there's several companies out there uh, that have demonstrated a capability, but those are primarily on bigger platforms. We need to be able to have that same capability on your quadcopters, for example. Let, let's, I'll tell you what, let's get back to that thought, how we're going to take what's been done and developed so far and push it forward after we take our one-minute break here. And by the way, the show is now 45, uh, used to be 45 minutes, I think, last time you were on. is half an hour now, so it's, it gets very compressed. Let's take a break and come right back and talk about that situation. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Greetings, I'm Stephen Philip Katz, the longtime host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii. Think Tech is important to me because without Think Tech, I never would have had a chance to realize my dream of having a show of talking with other therapists, finding out what they're doing and sharing it with the world at large. Now, for the first time ever, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to Think Tech will run only during the month of November, and you can help. Please donate what you can so that Think Tech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming like mine. I've already made my donation and I look forward to yours. Please send in your tax deductible contribution by going to this website, www.thanksforthinktech.causevox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by ThinkTech, Hawaii's 30 plus weekly shows, thank you for your generosity. It is still the noon hour on Thursday, folks. Ted Ralston here with our show, Where the Drone Leads, having a, a violent conversation with one of our favorite hosts on the, our guest on the show, uh, Dave Place from Punahou and Honolulu and now San Diego. Uh, retired out of the Navy, out of the Navy Postgraduate School, long-term, long-time UAS uh, operator, uh, fiction auto, and, uh, and thinker. We we're just talking before the break about how to take the work that's been done and we could generalize it beyond unmanned traffic management program. How do we take the work that's been done by in FAA programs and NASA programs and such and stand them up so that everybody who wants to apply to do something in this uh, pilot program has access commonly to the state of what's been going on in these other programs? Well, so this meeting on the 30th of November is a NASA, my understanding is it's a NASA initiative to bring folks up to date on where UTM stands. UTM is just a tool, but since it's specifically mentioned in the presidential memorandum specifically, then I think uh, you bring up a good point that, so how do the, the folks that don't follow this routinely, yet they are being charged with providing some insight to DOT and the FAA, how do they know what to do? Now, they may have their own thoughts regardless of UTM, but I think you, if they were brought up to speed on what UTM is attempting to accomplish, that would go a long way towards them providing valid inputs to the state and local level inputs to DOT. So perhaps a recommendation uh, to DOT or and or NASA would be this event that occurs on the 30th of November uh, they might want to try and make that available via webinar or at least have folks be able to dial in and observe the dialogue that goes on during this conference. Amen. Oh, that's a great idea. And, and that I, I will be certainly happy to go to my office when we're done and type that up and send that into the uh, FAA website that is collecting ideas on this. But that also makes me think there's probably other things that the government has invested in 
that are applicable technologies that are were, were designed to go in this direction. I don't know where they may be, don't even, don't even know how to find them. But what I'm thinking is that uh, uh, that little guy in, in Montana or somewhere who has a bright idea and wants to get involved here may not know about that work that's already been done. So that, we are, that's absolutely true, and there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of private companies that are also, I mean, so the whole thing evolves to, I mean, we can so you do you have flight you have 107 certifications right now, but those are restricted to line of sight operation, as almost anybody understands. The real end state is to do beyond line of sight. So you, I mean, you can only see a quadcopter a quarter of a mile away. But clearly, the mission area, whether it's doing agriculture or public safety, typically is a lot further away than a quarter mile. So how do you do that? Well, you need beyond line of sight. How are you going to do beyond line of sight? Well, you need to have to know where all the traffic is, all the air traffic. So there are companies out there that are understand this requirement to do beyond line of sight, and they are facilitating that capability by generating, and I'll just use one example, um, General Atomics has built a do regard radar, specifically that will support beyond line of sight operations. Now that's not, I don't believe that's a government funded initiative. I believe that's General Atomics doing that on their own because they understand the value in being able to do that beyond line of sight. But there are other companies out there that also have been looking at this beyond line of sight issue. Uh, I think that the Assure program down in Mississippi, which is a conglomeration of lots of universities, lots of industry folks, I think they are also looking at how do we safely and successfully achieve beyond line of sight operations. And that's going to be the key. I mean, so right now the FAA has you know, instituted some regulations that provide us some, us, I use that term loosely, but particularly the commercial folks, some local, very local capability to use their UAVs. Well, you know, this is, an, this is really something that is almost structural that needs to be looked at broadly within this FAA pilot program, and I, I say this very seriously. Uh, the private companies that have done their own investment, their own R&D, and their own testing, hats off to them, that's great. If they can use that preparatory development in some way that differentiates them from somebody else, and they can bring that in through a state agency, because only state or, or tribal or uh, city agencies can be part of this. Uh, commercial partners have to be coming in as a partner rather than a principal. Uh, but to their great credit, if they've done that work, hey, let's give them credit, let them solve the problem, and let's take, take it on. However, if there's been government investment that has generated this technology, such as the UTM program, that really has to be available commonly to all particular participants, including work done by the Assure operation, as you point out, down in uh, Mississippi. So that's, I think, a, an important thing for us to have the FAA uh, take on, is to find a way to get that information out uh, to the larger audience. But I'd like to follow up that by saying that, uh, and I'm glad you brought up Beyond Line of Sight. Certainly Beyond Line of Sight is one of the key, in fact that's the first thing listed as the technical functionality that's required here, beyond the governance issue and how you're going to operate rules and regulations and manners of operation and such. It's Beyond Line of Sight. That's the measurable thing that is going to be uh, rewarded for work here. There's also something called ELOS now, extended beyond line of sight, I guess is what that means, although I don't, haven't seen a definition of how beyond and extended relate to each other. But uh, those two are the top of the, of the pyramid in terms of uh, what's needed. Operations or flight over people, and that means uh, having a 10 to the minus ninth safety or something like that that allows you to operate over people that aren't involved in the event. Um, and then operations at night. So these are the things that are in the in the waiver domain of uh, 107 and the, and the 333s, but these are to be out front in in this particular program. So uh, having said that, that means that operations that are allowed under 107 aren't interesting to this pilot program. What's interesting to them is things that are beyond where 107 or the 333s will take you. So yeah, I would agree with that, but I, I mean just to. No, I'm not skewing General Atomics at all. In fact, I believe that the FAA, uh, GA, General Atomics, is keeping the FAA informed on the progress they are making. So 
the FAA realizes the value of the online of sight, and they're, you know, I'm sure other folks are keeping the FAA informed as well. But we still need to get, which is behind the initiative for this, to get the stake and state and local inputs to the entire process. And to that extent, the the figure of merit or the thing that's rewarded in the state and local domain is the term collaboration and another term integration. And an interesting question is, I've actually posed this to FAA already, how do you measure collaboration among government agencies? How do you determine something is well collaborated or something is poorly collaborated? How do you measure integration? Uh, how do you know if the thing is fully integrated? Partly integrated. If you had a device that did integration, where do you bolt it onto the UAS? So there's these these you know grand terms that don't have uh, necessarily measurable uh, parameters associated with them, but yet they are the key terms in the program. So we have some uh, reward generating uh, thinking to think about here and to understand uh, how how that's going to work as well. But these are just, you know, I'm just using these as like filler points. These are technical issues we have to worry about getting towards uh, making proposals to the solicitation. And that the. But things uh, like ADSB, <laughs> yeah. you know, that is also a useful tool. Those type of systems aren't necessarily well known by the small guy that is going to be providing yeah. this local input. So. It's kind of garbage in, garbage out. If you don't know what's there, and you go, well, wait a minute, we already can do that. Well, you know, oh, that, really? well, I didn't know that. And and again, as you say that, that's a great example. ADSB out. Uh, the kind of questions that come to my mind are: Was that was the communication system associated with that, which is SATCOM? Was that actually designed to operate in an urban canyon, which is where a lot of UAS operations will want to be in an urban canyon? Do you get signal reflection? Do you get some signal loss with that? But secondly, I've actually operated one small UAS that has dual ADSBs on it, and it, it, if it uh, sees somebody else's signal coming down, it simply says, warning, uh, aircraft nearby. Okay, I'm not sure what to do with that. I need a situational display, of, I need a uh, 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 collision avoidance guidance of some kind. But, but uh, David, we're, as I mentioned, we're, this program format is down to half an hour now, and we've managed to get uh, very little of the items of discussion underway, so I'll have to have you back again as this maybe around the 30th when the, you're going to go to the meeting, I'm sure, uh, at, down there in San Diego. And uh, well, let's, let's keep talking about this subject and make this the official output of information to the public on this, uh, in this, in this incredible FAA and the Department of Transportation pilot program for unmanned air systems operated in the local environment with local authority being invite, invited, being requested to provide uh, operational guidance. So, uh, Dave, thanks for coming on again. And um, got to get you back here to Hawaii. We should wait till next month, till after the 30th of November meeting, so we can have some good insight regarding NASA and the UTM program. We'll bring you on for that one, sir. Very, very looking forward to that one. Okay. Okay. And the surf still breaks here, David. So your board is still around somewhere. Your 96 Hobie, I'm sure. And, That's uh, exactly what it was. Yeah. Okay. Time to get back here and get some wax and get her out in the water. Okay. okay. Dave Place, thanks for coming on, and we'll see you all again next Thursday.